Shalom. Welcome. We are back after a small hiatus of about a month. <laughs> so we are commencing the Parsha of Ayishlach. Jacob has just returned now from 20 years of servitude under Levan. He's amassed tremendous wealth, flock, etc. And he is now a proprietor. He's now a person of influence. And he comes back and he's about to re-engage a brother he has not seen in 20 years, who didn't end their relationship 20 years before on good terms. On the contrary, Rivka, the mother, had said to Yaakov in the beginning, going back to the previous parsha, if you do not flee, I'm afraid that your brother will kill you. So clearly there was animosity between these two, and now we come to 20 years, two decades after, and the question now is, what's gonna happen with the effort to reconcile? What happens then? So there's so much in this section, and I, I, I think you can probably spend months on the opening line, if not years, to explore every level of the interaction between Jacob and Esau, Yaakov and Esau. But what I want to focus on is a bit different. I want to focus on a very strange teaching in the Talmud, and an even stranger teaching that appears in the writings of the Vilna Gaon regarding this idea. The Talmud says the following. It says, regarding arrogance, regarding chutzpah, having a little bit of pride, a little bit of, of ego, it asks the question, how much chutzpah is healthy? Somebody is egoless, we know, this is not really good either. You don't have a confident personality, especially in a world where you're challenged continuously, this could be your downfall. Okay, so I'm gonna put some energy into things. How much? How much is the appropriate amount? And beyond that can get dangerous. So in the Gemara and Sota, it gives the following strange mathematical statement. It says, when it comes to pride, strive for one-eighth of one-eighth. One-eighth of one-eighth of pride. Okay, so the question then becomes, what does that mean? What, you can have it to say, have enough pride to do the job. Have enough pride to feel confident. Have enough pride to feel secure. An eighth of an eighth is a very hard number for most people to translate into something of meaning. How does that mean anything? Take it down uh, uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay, a little is fine. But still, how much is appropriate? Right? An eighth of an eighth, I understand how small that would be. But what does that mean practically in terms of the avoda? So the Vilna Gaon offers the following insight. He says, when the sages said one-eighth of one-eighth, they weren't referring to a mathematical property per se. What they were hinting at is go to the eighth book, the eighth parsha, and the eighth verse of that parsha. That will tell you how much pride is appropriate. So if we start at Bereshit, go Noach, Lech Lecha, all the way to number eight, we come to this parsha, Vayishlach, is the eighth. And what is the eighth pasuk, the eighth verse? It says like this. Vayira Yaakov me'ot. Jacob was exceedingly afraid. Vayetzer lo, and it troubled him. Yachatz et ma'am, he divided the people. In other words, what's happening here? Remember who he is. He has his wives. This is pre-Sinai. Four wives, two concubines, two wives, 12 sons, one daughter, he has wealth, he has position, power, influence. He's now a person to be reckoned with. He's a confident person who left without anything. When he left initially Be'er Sheva, and he went toward Haran, toward Levan, we know the famous narrative, the famous Medrash. The son of Esau, the Elipaz, came to him, and Esau said to his son, Elipaz, go and kill my brother. Elipaz loved Yaakov, and he came to him and said, how do I fulfill my father's command and honor him, but not hurt you? So what happened to Yaakov? He relinquished all of his wealth and said, citing the Talmud, one who is poor is as if dead. It's as if you killed me. And all he left him was a staff. So he went from having nothing, literally, to building up such an army that he should be proud of this. This is 20 years of accomplishment. And yet, we have this strange verse that Yaakov was very afraid, very afraid to confront his brother Esau. Now the question that everybody asks is, didn't God say to him in Parshat Vayetze, in the famous dream of the ladder, 
I'll be with you, I will protect you, I'll be, I'll be your partner in this, you're not alone. Now, if Yaakov Avinu, chosen father, that tzaddik of his generation, that Nasi Hador, how could he be afraid to confront his brother Esau? It doesn't make any sense. It would make sense if I didn't have any sense of divine protection. Yaakov was guaranteed divine protection, prophetically and throughout the journey of 20 years under Laban. So how could he be afraid of Laban, or in this case, Esau? He's succeeded with Laban, he's made it this far, everything he was promised has now been accomplished. Why would he be afraid? What does that mean? So, the way the Vilna Gaon says it, is one-eighth of one-eighth of pride is to teach you. If you go to the eighth parsha and the eighth pasuk, which says Yaakov was very afraid, and it vexed him, it means, look how humble you should be. Even if you succeed, even if you have wealth and posterity and power and position and influence, you should always be a little bit afraid that maybe who you think you are, you're not. You have to reach even higher than that. So it's not that he feared Esau per se in a way of a trepidation. It means that he feared perhaps his merit was still insufficient. So the Vilna Gaon explains, all it tells you from the Talmud is, make sure no matter how great you become, there's always a little bit of the fear that maybe you've not reached your potential. Hence, you're a little bit afraid, you've not accumulated what you thought. Okay, that's a beautiful narrative, fine. But there's something else here. The name of this course is how to understand the transformation of character. That's what we're referring to in this course. What if I told you that the entire secret of the service of man depends upon a proper understanding of this verse? Everything according to Hasidut about how we're meant to serve and transform who we are, and by definition transform the world, depends upon a proper exegetical understanding of this pasuk. So here's how it begins. One of the great Hasidic masters that people don't know enough of because we don't talk about him too much in this area, when you, typically when it comes to Hasidus, we talk about more things that we are common with, like Rabbi Nachman, Lubavitch Rebbe, etc. The Rebbe of Kamarna, I don't know if there's a Kamarna Hasidic gathering in this, in this city, but Kamarna is perhaps one of the most important Hasidic personalities in all of Hasidus. Why? He was the one that taught many of the original teachings of the Baal Shem Tov to the world, and his texts are unbelievably deep of a blend between the Kabbalah of the Baal Shem Tov and the Kabbalah of the Yerizal. So the Admor, the founder of Karmarna Hasidus, brings down the following. He says, if you look at the word Vayira, which means, and he became frightened. It just means he became frightened. The proper way to write this word would be Vav Yud Resh Aleph. It's written here, Vav Yud Yud Resh Aleph. And a whole additional letter is added, a repetition of the Yud, for no grammatical reason. It doesn't need to be. This is an addition that is coming to teach something else. And the Torah, by the way, if you go back to Parshat Noach, what is the Torah called in terms of its language? Safat Echat, a simple language, simple. The complexity of Ivrit is not complex. <laughs> That's the trick, it's a simple language. It's not like English, all kinds of exceptions and all kinds of languages come together. It's a pure divine language. In fact, those words, Kabbalah teaches, Safat Echat, one tongue, has the same numerical value as Lashon HaKodesh, the holy tongue, according to Rabbi Chaim Vital. So Hebrew is supposed to be simple. So why would it add a whole nother letter into the word that is not grammatically necessary, unless it's teaching something else. Okay, so here's how it starts. Says the Rebbe of Kamarna in his famous commentary called Hechel Habaracha. He says, there's a question, a philosophical question asked via the Baal Shem Tov. The question is, God is referred to as Vinora. If you go back to the original dream of Jacob with the ladder, this place is awesome, he said. And we say it in the Amida. Elokei Abraham, Elokei Yitzhak, Elokei Yaakov, Ha'el Hagadol Hagibor Vehanora. What does Nora mean? The awesome one, awesomeness. So the Baal Shem Tov asked the question, if God is called awesome, invoking the image of a king, you know, a mighty king, shouldn't fear come to somebody automatically? He says, imagine a physical king. Go back to the days of King Solomon. 
when you walked into the physical court and you're looking at the king and the throne and his visory and all the things around him, if you look at the king and you're 10, 15 feet away, you're going to feel the trepidation. You're going to feel the actual fear, right? So the question then becomes is, how is it that we are commanded in the Torah, this is a command in the Torah, V'yata Yisrael, Ma Hashem Elokecha She'el Me'imach, Hi'im Le'yira Et Hashem. It asks the question, and now Israel, what does God your God ask of you except only to fear Him? It's asking for fear. So if fear is the objective, but God is called the awesome one, the great king, shouldn't fear be automatic, just endemic to the human condition? You walk around, you have Yirat Hashem all the time, you feel the awe, you feel the trepidation, you feel the consciousness of the king standing in front of you. That's the question. So the Baal Shem Tov comes and says, the secret of this is, there are two kinds of fear that are in the world. One fear, says the Baal Shem Tov, is called natural fear. And he gives many examples. Uh, the lion is fearful of an animal that can eat it. The fox is scared of the lion. He gives all kinds of examples that in the animal kingdom, a predator invokes fear, and the prey is fearful. So one kind of fear is natural in the sense that it's part of nature. You fear loss. You fear the loss of your life. You fear the loss of your property. God forbid your children. God forbid your home. You fear these things. But there's a higher fear called yira ila'a, supernal fear. And that is fear not of loss, it's fear of God himself. The Zohar comes and explains there's two levels of fear. One's called yira chitzonit, it's an outer fear. One's called yira pini mute, inner fear. What's the difference? Take a relationship. So, you know, working in the marriage industry, <laughs> there's sometimes infidelity is a problem. And there's questions about, you know, what if somebody struggles with that? So imagine if one person says to the other in a couple, I won't cheat on you because if I do, I'm afraid you'll ruin my name. I'm with you because I know that if I go out and make a mistake, make a mistake, and I cheat, I'm afraid you will destroy me. You will tell everybody my, my sin, it'll be the end of me, reputation's gone, my pride is gone, I'm fearful of what you may do to me. That's one kind of fear. But the Zohar comes and says, if somebody operates by that kind of fear in relation to God, then similar to a human relationship, it's utterly and completely narcissistic. You're serving you. Why am I not cheating? Not because of you, what it may do to you. It's what it may do to me. That if I violate this contract between us, you will hurt me. It's going to affect me. It's going to harm me. The higher fear within a human relationship is, why will I not cheat in a moment of weakness? Because God forbid if I do, you're hurt because of it. What happens if you're injured? What will I do if, if I make a mistake and you are shamed and you feel bad and you feel lesser than? I can't live with that. It's very different. The outcome's the same. You're not going to commit the sin. But the re reality behind it is, one is self-service. The other one is, I'm serving you. I care about you. So the Zohar concludes, these two kinds of fear in relation to Hashem, relation to God, are very similar. If I serve God only because I may, if I make a mistake or I go off the path, lose my blessing, lose my advantage, God forbid, lose my health, my property, my children. If that's the motivation, then the whole basis of fear is a fear of oneself. It's fear of you. It's what you will lose. But remember something. Is man and God connected simply as a king and a servant? No. What is the most cherished book that we have in the whole Torah? That according to the sages, if the whole Torah is called holy, this book is called the Holy of Holies. Who knows? Song of Songs. And what is the Song of Songs? A love story. And the entire language of it, many Sephardi shuls, they'll read it before Shabbat. The language of it is romance. The king and his bride. The chatan v'kala. The melech and his queen. So that's a very different relationship. So in terms of God, if it would be king and servant, then yes, lower fear is appropriate. If the servant makes a mistake, it could be the end of him. If it's father and child, okay, there's still it's closer, but husband and wife? 
That's according to Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest of all kings, the epitome of what it's meant to be with God. Not king and servant. It's really husband and wife. Chatan v'kala. So if I treat my spouse with the respect of, well, God, if I violate your laws, I'm really going to suffer for it. That's the equivalent of saying to your spouse, I only don't hurt you because of me. Not so romantic. <laughs> Not so good. It's indicative that you're a self-serving person. It's about you. But if I say, Ani l'dodi, l'dodi li, I am for my beloved, my beloved is for me, and if God forbid I hurt you, I'm hurt because I'm hurting you, not because of the punishment. That's an old saying, by the way, in Chassidut. We say the mitnagdim, the classical mitnagdim, they fear the result of sin, punishment. The Chassid fears the sin itself. Because God forbid there's a nechitza, a wall put between my beloved. So, in other words, God forbid we rely upon lower fear to be the motivating factor to our relationship with the king. He's a king, yes, but we are the queen. It's husband and wife. It's not meant to be, God forbid, lord and servant, we're lowly, we're inadequate, chas v'shama, king and queen. But isn't that what Abraham promotes? Like, I'm just... Uh, the king and the queen? No, no, he says I'm just flesh and blood, just dust. Anochi afar ve'afir. Very good. Yeah. So in that sense, he's talking about relative to his source in the upper world. The lower manifestation that you see, says the Tanya, is as if dust and ash. So he's talking more about his quality of chesed. He's saying that relative to the supernal kindness, relative to that quality, the chesed of Atzilut, my representation of it, being a Merakaba for it, is like literally just dust and ash. But in terms of the relationship with Hashem, groom and bride especially after Mount Sinai. So watch this. Jacob fears. We mentioned there's two yuds in this word. There should only be one. Says the Baal Shem Tov, one kind of fear that we do have is a natural fear, and the fear of loss is a big one. All humans have that. God forbid I lose something I love. That's endemic to us. The fear the Torah asks from you is not lower fear. And that verse comes and says, and now Israel... Ma Hashem Elokecha Sho'el Mi'imach Ki in Yira For fear means higher fear, says Chassidus. What it's saying to you is, you must strive to accomplish a relationship where the fears that you have is not about your loss at all, but about the love of the other and God forbid the harm that will come to them if infidelity happens. Higher fear, not lower fear. And now comes the $100 million question, which is obvious. Okay, if I'm a tzaddik, I have exceptional spiritual clarity, this makes sense. But I'm not a tzaddik, nowhere close. I'm an average person walking along the path, trying to make things work. How can I possibly come to a place of not having any concern at all about myself? That's a very tall order to ask. So the Baal Shem Tov comes and says, God gives you the ultimate kindness. What is that kindness? He's going to give you natural fear automatically that you can sublimate it and lift it to a higher fear. He gets it going. In other words, there's two yuds in this word. Says the Heichel Abarachat, the Rebbe of Kamarna, it means this. Yaakov's fear initially was the lower fear of, uh-oh, if my brother comes, if he comes to me and attacks me, as the Psukim talk about, I can lose children, I can lose property, I can lose my wealth. So he divides. It says, by yichatz et ta'am, he divides the people that are with him, and the sheep and the flock and the cattle, he's dividing them because of the lower fear of what's going to happen if I'm attacked, I can't defend myself, he wins, everything is, is lost. Lower fear. But then what happens is, Jacob prays. And he says the following. He says, God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, Hashem, HaOmer Eli, who said to me, return to your land, back to Israel after Levan, and to your birthplace, and I'll be good to you. And he concludes by saying, my fear is I want you to save me. Please, Hashem, save me and my family. Why? Because I'm concerned that lest he comes, Esau will come, Vihikani Eim Albanim, and he'll strike the mother on the child. 
So the simple meaning of it is, I don't want my family to die. God forbid my, my wives are hurt, my children are hurt, God forbid. But Hasidus comes and says, that's not what this means. Al pisot. What it means according to Kabbalah is, he reached the higher fear. What was he saying here? So we all know that when we talk about the Divine Presence, we talk about in the Talmud, we talk about in the Torah directly, when we go into exile, where's Hashem? Waiting for us in Yerushalayim somewhere? Where's Hashem? With us, right? As it says, Anochi b'tzara, I'm with you in trouble, right? And we say every day, Bechol tzaratam lo tzar. In all of their troubles, says Hashem, I am in trouble. I feel it too. I'm with you in Galut. You're never alone. In fact, we know from the Baal Shem Tov, this is why the word sin, the word chet, how do we spell it? Chet, tet, and alf. Chet and tet, we hear when you say it, chet. You don't hear the alf. Why? The alf is silent. To tell you, even in the hour that you sin, and you don't hear God, so to speak. You're not connected in such a way that you're conscious of it. But the alf is there. It's right there with you. And says the Baal Shem Tov, you're never alone. Even when you sin, even when you fall, even when you stumble, the Aluf Hashem Olam, the Divine One, is with you always. So now, when Jacob realizes the consequence of Esau winning, of Esau coming into the camp and dividing everything up and destroying him, is he will go into exile, as we eventually did when the Romans attacked Yerushalayim. When the Second Temple was destroyed in 70 CE, he went into the current Galut that we're in now for more than 2,000 years. That's called the Roman exile, the exile of Esau. And so what happens there? We just said, if we go into exile, who goes into? God goes into exile. Okay, now, even though we talked about groom and bride, okay, we also know that another relationship is when the Jewish people are inadequate in their spiritual development, and we're still weak, we're still not conscious properly, Hashem sustains us, nourishes us, so that becomes more like a mother and a child. So sometimes when God is nourishing or nurturing or supporting, he's called mother. In fact, the Shekhinah is often called in Kabbalah, Ima Tatka'a, the lower mother. Okay, so now, reread the verses. When he first encounters Esau, it says, the year of Yaakov, he feared Me'od greatly, with two Yuds in the word. Why? Says the Baal Shem Tov, says the Hechul Abracha. Because initially, as the verses teach, he was so scared of personal loss, he became frantic. He divided everything up, we'll put half here, half there, it planned things out. If one dies, one will live. This is a very, very detailed plot. He's preparing. But then when he talks to Hashem, he says, well, wait a second, it's not about that. That is bad, yes. The real tsar, the real trouble is, God forbid he kani aim abanim, he strikes the mother on the children. To say it differently, if he strikes and your children, Am Yisrael, go into exile, the mother will have to go with them. That's what he came to. In other words, he was saying, my greatest fear, Hashem, is not my exile. It's the fact that if I go into exile, you're going there too. I put you into exile. You, the mother, will have to go into exile and dwell with us as we're now 2,000 plus years. In other words, the double yud means, by year of two yuds, that there's two levels, two dimensions to fear. Once we have normal fear, natural fear, we take the natural fear, lift it higher. What Hashem says to us is, strive in your life to obtain a fear, to acquire a fear, which is not the fear of punishment, but the fear of harming the relationship itself. Just as Yaakov himself in the verse says, I first feared my property, but then I came to evolve to a position where I fear you. I fear the mother on the son being struck, being damaged. So that's why there are two yuds here. So now we'll take it one step further. Okay. So according to the Baal Shem Tov, natural fear is given to us in order that we can lift it higher and become more of an elevated fear, fine. And Yaakov himself models that, first scared of his property, then scared of the fact that the Ikananu Eim al-Banin, he will strike the mother, the Shekhinah on the children, the, the people. 
and they'll both be struck together. But let's take it one step beyond. Practically speaking, how does somebody get to a position where they can successfully take an emotion, whatever emotion is of the moment, and lift it higher? Take it to a divine service as opposed to a self-serving thing. We'll take a few of those. Okay, so we have fear is one of them, maybe the most common. Let's take, for example, happiness. Happiness. There's all kinds of ways to become happy. There are people who are happy in a way that the happy part leads to frivolty. It's the silliness. Like our sages say in the Gemara in Brachot, in Perak Hay, it talks about a wedding. And at the wedding, the father of the groom noticed there was a disorderliness that was taking place because he saw there was too much happiness in the sense that he could see in the people it became imbalanced. It was too much to one side. So what did he do very famously? Picked up a vase worth 300 zoos, shattered it on the ground, and it inculcated fear into the people to balance out the emotion. Okay, so let's take so happiness to an extreme is interest, right? So too, fear to an extreme is not good for us. Any emotion taken to an extreme becomes an injury. So our objective is to lift any emotion we have to a higher level, not just the fear that we read about here. How do we accomplish that? How does someone do that? So, to understand this, it could be a whole set of courses. We'll keep it simple and straightforward. Any time you have an emotion for any reason, if you, for example, wake up in a certain mood, and you don't like the emotion that you're in. You have a moment in the course of the day where you feel a certain emotion overtake you. You don't, you don't like what that feels like, or it takes you the wrong direction. The Torah says to you, every emotion you have is often a reflection of, or a parallel to, what transpires in the heavens above. You're registering deeply what is going on in the upper worlds, and you're feeling something that maybe isn't logical. But you have to use what you feel. What's going on? Like you're talking about the angels fighting you? No, 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 no. Even, even certain conditions within the spirit or the moment of the day, or certain things that go on elicit a certain response below in the world. Does it, does it, don't, don't our actions have an effect on that, not the reverse? It, it's both ways. It, really? it goes, it goes, it's just like the nervous system, right? That it goes from brain to body. But if I touch something, it goes from efferent nerves through the whole nervous system, up the CNS, up to the brain. It goes both ways. So it's above to below and below to above. Okay. So it works two ways. So yeah, the point here is that we have an opportunity when we have an emotion to use the emotion to our advantage, even if the emotion in its raw nature is against us. So well, here's an ex problems, right? exactly. Yeah, let's just assume, for example, that we, on all levels, there's some way we can use who we are. I'll give an example of that. Let's say the concern is trepidation. I'm worried about something. I have a worry about some condition in the world. Now, if I worry about something, typically it preoccupies all of me. If I'm worried about a certain condition, my brain takes over, I get too much into the emotion, it trickles down into my heart, into my body, into my limbs, and I become preoccupied to the point where I can check out of my divine responsibility, I stop serving. I don't become any longer of service. So how does one take a fallen emotion and elevate it? So the Torah comes and says it's a very simple thing. It's very easy to do if you practice it. All you have to do is figure out how the emotion connects to divine service. So as an example, sadness. Our sages tell us, avoid it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't mire in depression. Don't mire in the yiri dam. It's a very, very interesting and creates the antithesis to happiness that you have to have. But let's say one is sad, authentically sad. How does that become a divine service? So our sages tell us, if one is sad, and they're, they're laboring in a certain thing that affects them, it says, if a person goes ahead and says to himself, I will take the sadness and change it to a sadness of the condition of the divine presence in exile. As an example, tikkun chatzot. There's a ritual, you wake up at midnight, there's a whole liturgy for this, and you bewail the fact that the divine presence is in fact in exile. It's called tikkun rachel. Tikkun Leah is the happiness of the imminent future redemption. In other words, it's not the sadness that's the problem. It's how it's utilized. If I dwell in my sadness and I stay there, it becomes an injury. If I say to myself, ah, why am I sad? 
Because certainly if the divine presence were in redemption, it would be a universal fixing. There wouldn't be this deficit. In fact, I feel at times sad, overwhelmed, fearful, is only because the general state of Galut is the Shekhinah is in exile. So one can then take the sadness and say, wait a second, I'm not limited here. That's the emotion of the moment, and I can utilize that to serve. So what would I do? Open up Psalms. Start reading Tehillim. Think about the greater consequence of exile. Think about the conditions of it beyond you. Yes, it hurts me, but look how many that affects. Look at the poverty, the hopelessness in the world. The feeling of be if you generalize it to a greater image, what happens then is you become a person for the world, not just yourself. So it's not the sadness, it's the fact you dwell in it in a way that only you are sad. You become the main focus. But if you become the catalyst to understand the greater problem, then you're a person of service. What about happiness? Now, if I'm happy, if, I, if I'm at a wedding, if I'm somewhere in a field of simcha, right? I can then rejoice in the fact that when every groom and bride come together and they unify, it's a microcosm of the future unification between the divine groom Hashem and his bride, the Jewish people. The imminent redemption where we are dancing together in Yerushalayim, feeling the closeness and the presence of Hashem. That's a rectified happiness. It's a good happiness. So every single emotion, no matter how difficult it may be at times, if you think about how it connects in the Torah, how the fact there's no part of you, no part of you, that ever does not have a connection to the system. What's lacking sometimes is the imagination of the know-how to do it. But every emotion, every quality has its place, all of them. There's a book by the Ramban, Nachmanides, that says, it's called uh, the, the Book of Trust and Faith, Bitachon Be'amuna. He says, whenever the emotion's aroused, make sure in that arousal, you take the arousal, you use it quickly, and you mobilize it toward divine service. So he says, allow the arousal to be permission as to what emotion God wants from you that you should be using right now to serve. So as opposed to fighting it, I've met people before where they'll often say, I, I shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't be sad. I shouldn't be, a, and they judge it as if they have a say-so. What if you don't have a say-so? What if what's happening when you have the emotion is a call to service? That you're meant to use that emotion for the purpose of service. Rav Cook, Rav Abraham Cook, once said in his commentary to the Talmud, he says, what real peace is, is not the peace of one system predominating over all others. It's not an elected government where suddenly one code, one law is everything. What real peace happens to be is the ability to see the truth in all systems and how that thread connects everything together. So there can be this system and that system and that way and this way and that path and that path. You're not saying, God forbid, it's my path. Your path is one truth. The true shalom means each and every thing shows a connection to its divine offer. That's Mashiach's time, the power to see the divine in everything. Same thing with this. If you say about your heart, this emotion can serve, this emotion cannot. This emotion's godly, this emotion's useless. If you judge it to be where parts of you are useless, God forbid, then you're fractured. That says the Ramban, but if the arousal is, you, you capture it immediately, and you mobilize it into service. You're using the emotion. You're using it for a spiritual, it becomes a tool for God versus a narcissistic judgment of yourself. I'm not good, I'm not this. It's a big problem. So when we talk about mastering the heart, we are not Sadiqim. So as it's brought in Sefer Tanya, that Sadiq lords over the heart, and as King David says, the, the, the heart of me is hollow. Belibi halal bikirbi. Meaning, he killed his own evil inclination through fasting and practices and transformed the whole part of him into good. Okay, that's great. It's King David. <laughs> it's Tafid Melech. That's not me. So how does a normal mortal being take emotion if you can't transform it to its complete opposite and use it? And the answer is, find how it connects to God. Find how that emotion of the moment can become a tool for use and use it. If you're sad, cry about the Shekhinah. Think about how well, if I'm sad, 
my little micro existence. What about millenniums in Galut? The fact that the whole world is in a condition like this. If I'm happy, connected to service. Everything requires happiness. Pray, do a mitzvah, study Torah with the simcha. Whatever emotion is of the moment, use it. So if you can capture it and direct it accordingly, that's for our level, the rectification of the heart. Which is also why, by the way, just parenthetically, how during the Haggadah of Pesach, we have a general plate, the Seder plate. We arrange all the components on the plate. We have three matzot, according to the Arizal's tradition, three matzot. Then you have the zroa and the Beitza, and the Marur, and the Chorosit. We arrange everything according to its structure and its power in the soul. Parpas, Hazeret, and the plate. The plate, according to the Arizal, is Malchut. The idea of Malchut in Kabbalah. All the other parts of the plate are the other spirot, the other powers that are oriented above it. Three matzot, three mental powers, chabad. Zroa, chesed, beitza, gevura, marur, tiferet. So the question is, what does that mean practically? That the plate's machut, all the other parts, what it really means, says the tiferet banim is, no matter what power comes to you, as long as each power you have is on the plate, of divine service, but what's machut in general? The accepting of the yoke of the king. Kabbalat O, we say. There was a king, and there was a yoke, and I accept it, and I'm mobilizing myself toward it. Whatever power is aroused, if you capture it on the plate of service, and you magbil hadavar, you limit it to a divine expression, you're halfway home. That is by definition the rectification of the heart. So when we have a double yud appear in this word, by Yir Yaakov Me'od, he feared greatly. It does not mean God forbid, it was simply a fear of, I don't trust Hashem. It was showing us that even Yaakov's own journey, says the Baal Shem Tov, demonstrates how lower fear can become higher fear, how fear of oneself can become fear of the other. So if you read the Psukim again, this is the eighth parsha and the eighth pasuk in it. Understand that every fear you have, every hesitation that you have, if you direct it right, as Jacob himself did, can become a divine service. It can become not the fear of you, but the fear of, God forbid, striking the mother on the children, the divine presence on her children, which are both now in exile. So all we have to do is emulate this with all of the emotions. We take what we are, we direct it toward the idea that there is no part of you ever that's useless, that cannot serve, that cannot be mobilized. On the contrary, whatever you're feeling for the moment, how does it relate? Whatever you feel, how does it connect? If you can answer that, then you're always in service. I'll give one more example. Sleep. The Chatam Sofer writes in Torah Moshe regarding Chaya Sara. It mentions there, it says, these are the years of the life of Sara. And it mentions it. She lived 120 and 7, year, year, years, years, year, and it says the life of Sarah. So everybody asks the question, why does it repeat itself twice? It already said these are the years of Sarah, 127, done. Why say a second time again the life of Sarah? We know that. So the Chatzam Sofer says because she lived two lives. One life was the life of her daytime service, praying, doing mitzvot, converting the masses, Engaging with the people, that's a spiritual service. What people don't know is, she even served at night. What does nighttime refer to? Simple, physical things people do. Brushing your teeth, eating, drinking, sleeping. Somebody could think in their head, God forbid, these are not divine. These are ordinary. Says the Chatam Sofer, wrong. Because if somebody says in his head, why do I sleep? to have the energy to better serve tomorrow. Why do I eat? To elevate the sparks contained in the food and to give myself the power to serve. So even physical things, depending upon the intentionality behind them, become spiritual things. That's why Sarah had two lives, not just alive in the daytime, but she was alive at night as well. Conquered both sides. That's how we fix the emotions. Recognize that A, there's never an emotion that you have, an arousal of feeling that is inadequate. Second, you have to use all that you are for the sake of serving Hashem. 
Now I will say to you one very important concept, it's, it's key, and that is, if you look at the Torah itself, we have this indicated in the model of Torah. What letter begins the Torah? What's the first letter? Bet. Bet. Of what word? Bereshit in the beginning. What letter ends the Torah? Okay. Huh? Wait, no. Yeah, okay. The last letter though is Israel. Israel. So the last three words of the Torah is Moshe Le'enei Yisrael ends with a Lamed. So it begins with a Bet, ends with a Lamed. Now in Simcha Torah, after we do the Hakafot, we dance, the next day you read the Torah, you finish Zot HaBaracha, and you start Bereshi, you connect the end back to the beginning, like what you just said now, but the Lamed of Israel connects back to the Bet of Bereshit, you have the word Lev, heart. Okay, but wait a second. But that's not how the Torah is made. The Torah is made beginning with a Bet and ending with a Lamed. It's really like the what, uh, that's with an ayin. Good, but it's very similar. Take the ayin out. What does Baal mean? Bet Lamed. It means negation. Negation. So the heart this way, Lamed Bet is heart. Flip the letters, negation. So why in the Torah does the Torah's initial model say, here's the bet, where you begin, the lamed you end, and that's negation. Until you reconnect back to the beginning, then you have the word heart. We negate avodazara. Okay, so, but a certain kind of avodazara. The first negation is to say to you, in order to have a rectified heart, a refined heart, you have to first negate every emotion in the original raw form. So when you, like look what Yaakov did. What was the initial fear about? The cattle, the property, the children, the physical things. I may suffer, I may lose. So what did Yaakov have to do? Negate that, to go to the higher fear, which is, wait a second, the emotion I feel, that's not the true expression of the heart. The true expression is, and I turn that actually into a true emotion. In other words, that's how you fix it. Whatever emotion you have, realize what you feel in the hour. Let's say you're upset. If you dwell in the upset, say, wait a second, this can be used, but not in the form I feel it. I have to first negate it. I step back. Yes, I'm upset. Yes, there could be a good reason for it, but it's not about me. There's a bigger service here. So first, negate the narcissistic manifestation of the emotion. Then you can flip the letters into a true heart, a true lev that's able to serve. That's why it's first negation, then heart. Because to serve God properly, we can't rely upon being not sadiqim, that every emotion is pure. Every emotion is an available tool. But the same hammer that can hit can also build. The same blade that can cut can also be used, be used for an artistic service. The heart is both ways. If you negate the emotion first, then you build with it, you'll serve. If you rely upon raw emotion alone, you won't. Now our sages tell us, the beauty of the heart is, it's exactly the secret of the Mizbeach in the Beis HaMikdash, the, art, the actual altar, the copper altar in the temple. When you went into the courtyard, you had the copper altar, and you had the kiyur, the wash basin. The copper altar in its dimensions, according to Torah, is what? 32 by 32. Amot. Lev. Lev. So 32 is Lamed Bet, heart. So the building of the altar is a heart by a heart. One heart by one heart. That's the altar. So when you ask the question, there's no Besa Mikdash today, there's no Karbanot being offered today, where's the Mizbeach? Where's the altar? Yeah. In our heart. In our heart. If the heart itself becomes a vehicle of service, then look, notice how it's 32 by 32. It's the same reason why when you say the Biyah Hafta after the Shema, you say, Bechol Levavvicha, as our sages point out. It doesn't say, Bechol Levcha. It says, Levavvicha, two hearts. To say to you, serve in both ways. Serve using the divine part of you. It's easy. Divine emotion is very simple. It comes Yom Kippur, it comes Rosh Hashanah, it comes on Sukkot. What about the other heart? The animal heart. The natural emotions, <coughs> natural fear, natural happiness, natural, all the natural stuff. Can that be an altar too? Yes. If you negate in order to build, if you negate in order to reconstruct. So negate the heart and you'll have heart by heart, lave by lave. That's a full mizbeach. That is an altar. And once you have that, everything else is easy.
then it becomes simple. But we're so practiced in the judgment of oneself. This is bad, and that is bad, and I am bad, and this is... And we judge it, as opposed to saying, let's convert the language, this is an opportunity, that is an opportunity, that is an opportunity, and my goal is to find how to connect using it. That's what Yaakov taught us. Lower fear becomes higher fear. Natural becomes supernatural. Ordinary becomes extraordinary. That's how it works. Okay, any questions? We close. Okay. Yes? Good? Okay. Yes, one question. Back. Back to where you were saying about the about Gaulus. So yes. uh, the the reason why we call us is, is every single Jew is um, a law enforcement officer of Hashem of the Ten Commandments. So every single Jew that walks the earth, man, woman, and child, mm -hmm. is a law enforcement officer of Hashem to ignore the Torah, Ten Commandments. Yes. Whether they like it or not. Yes. So you can't be a law enforcement officer in your own land only because the whole world is Hashem's. That's right. So the fact that we're in Gaulus is because we're uh, being a law enforcement officer. Excellent. And everywhere. modeling and modeling the behavior, the right? Domain, which is the whole earth. Do you realize that what you said now is important because when a Jew, let's take for example at the office. Right? You're at the office and you're having a bad day. People feel how you feel, right? It's very easy to feel people's emotions. Let's say you're having a bad day and you model, okay, I'm not I'm not lying. I, I don't feel good. But I'm gonna find a way to use the emotion to tap into someone. So I'll give you an example of that. When I've had a hard day here and there, happens sometimes, and I work at the rehab center. I work with people who are much less fortunate than me. Now, if I have a hard day, and I'm feeling too much wrapped in myself, and I take the emotion of that, and I go to help to be, to be the officer, helping somebody who really feels bad because of all kinds of other problems, the rawness of my emotion makes me more in tune with them. If I turn to them, I can feel much deeper, much clearer where they're coming from. If I just wallow in my own misery at home alone in a dark room, it becomes really a self-serving tool for self-deprecating thoughts and self-deprecating speech. If I to use the register, if I turn it outward, and I take the emotion, and I find a way to make that person's problem, now that I can feel pain myself, I really, I know where you're coming from, because I feel it too. I feel it too. That's how you make a connection. Now make one more, just one more last premise, one more hint. The word exile in Hebrew is galut. The numerical value of the word is 439. Now our sages tell us, whenever you want to fix something, you add an aleph to it. Now you just said that coming into the, into the exile, our job is to model the behavior and bring God back in, right? So what is the initial sin of the Torah? What's the first sin of the whole Torah? Which one? Murder. How about before that? The tree. Right? The tree, right? Yes, that was the first actual murder, right? The first sin was tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? That sent us into exile, where good and evil are now mixed together. We have to differentiate things. That's the first one. So our sages say in the Gemara in Makot, Galut Michaper, every exile atones. It'll atone if you understand it properly. So we go into exile. What's the purpose of us going through the suffering and the hardships and difficulty? We're trying to fix that tree. So if according to the laws of Torah, by adding an aleph to something, you fix it, right? The tree is Eitz Hadda'at Tovera, a tree of knowledge, good and evil, okay? That equals 933. If you add one and you fix it, it means that you go into the Galut and you model the behavior, you bring God into it through your service, thought, speech, and deed, 933 becomes, adding one to it, 934. Okay? So what's 934 backwards? 934 backwards is? 439. Which equals galut. <laughs> so what exile is, is an attempt to rectify the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It rectifies it. But how is because the evil is not just some separate thing. <clears throat> the evil is God hiding. When I'm having an evil fallen moment, use it and you rectify this tree. You take the schism and you bring it back together. Yeah. And why aren't there seven exiles? For the seven emotions? Why aren't there seven exiles? Uh, okay, excellent question. So What's the question? Why aren't, there, why aren't there seven exiles? If there are seven emotions, there should be seven exiles. Well, right? and seven levels of tshuva. Right, yes, yeah, so the answer simply is, is that though we have seven emotions, right, there's really only, when we talk about the principal emotions, there are four. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's 
principal emotions and then what's called the branches of the emotions. So love, fear, and mercy are the principal emotions. Netzach, Chod, Yesod are called their branches. So the four are Hesed, Gevur, Tiferet, Malchut. So if you go through the whole system of exile, you're atoning by definition like anything. If I fix the source of water, I fix the flow that comes out of it, right? So if I can fix the fountain, I can fix the stream. So think about the ones that we don't have to fix as being the result of fixing the original ones. They, they become refined by definition. So that's the answer. What's 933 again? What's that? What was the 933? 933 is Eitzadah Atovara. Uh -huh. Right? If you add one, you fix it. 934 reflects the value of the word exile. Oh, I see. So like, if you're separated, 9 is uh, representing man, and then 33 is, is a redemption. 33 is a... You could say that. You could say, you say the, the Eitzadahs uh, trapped man, and now man seems to be redeemed. And that's what exile is? All exile is is the pressure. In fact, this is one more thing we'll say to what we're truly done. <laughs> Friedrich Rebbe writes, if you want to see how exile works, simple experiment. Find a ma'ayan, find a fountain where the water pops up. Take three, four rocks and press the flow from each side. So it's springing up this way and you compress it. That's what a galut is, right? Mitzrayim, mitzarim, it's constraint. If you press all the rocks together, what happens to the actual water? and it goes even higher. The pressure you put upon it causes it to spring even higher. So the whole purpose of our Galut is what you have locked in you will only come out under extraordinary pressure, similar to a diamond. A right? diamond is made under tremendous geological pressure. It can't be made with little pressure. It's tremendous pressure. So too, the true you comes out under pressure. So, which is a famous Queen song, under them. Okay. So in other words, <laughs> take, take the emotions, take what you have, use them all, and find a way to plug in even when you don't feel like it. Take even the bad part of you, and you rectify this tree. And bring it back to a point of unity. All right, thank you. Yeah, something? Yeah. Yes.